Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in again this afternoon. And uh, for those of you on television, we just checked with our studio audience. And my goodness, we got people from all over the country here today. Uh, Chicago and Florida and Missouri and uh, let's see, where else was it? Uh, Washington State, yeah. And uh, we're, we're just glad to have a representation from almost coast to coast. And again, for those of you out in television, we always invite you, if you're in the Tulsa area on a first Wednesday of the month, check with our girls and make sure we're taping and uh, make arrangements to come in. Oh yeah, and then I forgot about uh, Gloria over there from Florida. Boy, she's been looking forward to this day for months on end. So uh, we do, we appreciate when you folks come in from a distance and uh, spend the afternoon with us. All right, I'm not going to take any more time for announcements because, uh, you know, everybody w reminds me this is the only Bible study they really got, so we have to buy up the time, and uh, we'll get as much in as 30 minutes as we possibly can. All right, we're still going to continue on our walk through the book of Psalms, picking out the Messianic Psalms. In other words, those Psalms that are so definitively pointing to and are uh, representing the Messiah in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, that doesn't mean the rest of the Psalms don't mention it, but they are not as graphic. And so we're just picking out the Psalms that are most graphically describing his first advent and the glory that will follow. Okay, now I'm going to do like we did in the last taping for sure, maybe even the one before. I'm going to kick off, and I'm going to do this every maybe every program, because I want people to almost see these two verses in their sleep and be aware of it when you wake up in the morning. First Peter chapter 1, and we'll drop in at verse 10 and 11. Remembering now who wrote it, the Apostle Peter, who is he writing to? Fellow Jews who were looking forward, of course, to the coming of the tribulation just over the horizon and the second coming. They all thought that was going to be in their lifetime. But Peter is reminding them of something, and that's why we're taking an in-depth look at the book of Psalms. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets, the Old Testament writers, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Now I've got to stop a minute. I can't help it. I wish I could have that, don't you? Marilyn here is from Chicago, and she's been listening to me for years, so she and her friend Mary stopped by yesterday, and they put on a little skit, just for Irisons and mine, and uh, she's mimicking me, see, all the way through, from the way I start until the way I end. Well, it just reminded me of it, because this is part of it. <laughs> We're going to be stopping every now and then. When it says that they search diligently, do you know that even today in these Jewish yeshivas, you're going to want to know how to spell that, aren't you, Sharon? In the Jewish yeshivas, which are places of learning for young Jewish men, they may spend a whole day, maybe a week, just contemplating one verse of Scripture, or maybe even a part of a verse. Now, that's what I think of when I see this word, that those old prophets were looking at all these things diligently, not just haphazardly writing, but they were really searching and trying to get an understanding of all these Old Testament scriptures that were looking forward to a Messiah, which they understood. But as I mentioned the last time, and I'll probably mention it several times before we get through with this, that... They could understand the coming of a Messiah, but two of them? Now that threw them a curve. Because here it comes now, and, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. So they searched diligently, those prophets who prophesied or foretold of the grace that should come unto you. Now remember who Peter is writing to. He's writing to fellow Jews. And these prophets now, in verse 11, were searching the Old Testament scriptures what or what manner of time, the when, that the Spirit of Christ who was in them, as they wrote, remember, that's why we're always emphasizing Holy Spirit inspiration. Otherwise, these men could have never done what they did. 
All right? So that the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it, or I prefer he, when the Holy Spirit testified beforehand through the writing of these prophets now, the sufferings of Christ and the what? The glory that should follow. Now, if you'll remember way back when we were going through the book of Isaiah, pretty much chapter and verse, that I had laid out so clearly that Israel was being foretold that three times, three times they would suffer the discipline of God because of their unbelief, but it would be followed with blessings. The first one, of course, was the Babylonian. And then the second one, of course, that wasn't followed with blessings so much, but still of an act of God, was the 70 AD invasion and destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans and then their dispersion. But then the third one was the seven years of tribulation to be followed with the glory of the kingdom. And so all through Scripture, this seems to be the format. First the suffering, and then the glory that should follow. All right, now then, I had another brainstorm this morning, like I did last time we taped. I don't remember when it was I just first gotten up, or whether it was while we were having breakfast, but all of a sudden, as I was going over this again, see, I, I learned these when I teach them often enough. Yeah, I know these verses now by memory. They were searching diligently. What matter of time, see, that the Spirit had testified beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And I couldn't help but think, turn with me now to Romans, honey, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. And if it isn't the same thing, it's just unbelievable. It even Paul, with regard to the church age believer, it's sufferings many times, not always, I'll make that point in a minute here, but what's going to follow our earthly suffering? Oh, the glory of eternity that's ahead of us, see? Okay, Romans 8. Let's start at verse 17. And if we're children, and that we are, if we have become a believer of the death, burial, and resurrection, so if we're children, we're then heirs. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Now here it comes. If so be that we suffer with him, we may be also, what's the next word? Glorified. See the order? Now, I'm going to be careful here. This does not say that unless you suffer, you can't be glorified. It doesn't say that. But it says it's a possibility that we as believers may suffer, and Lord knows that they did for the last 2,000 years. My goodness, even during Paul's ministry, when these people were converted out of paganism, was it a bed of roses? Why, heavens no, they came under intense persecution. They came under complete rejection by their families and maybe their employers. And all the way up through the last 2,000 years, that has been the case for most believers. You know, we in America have been so blessed that we don't know what it is to suffer for our faith, but most of Christendom has. All right, so I'm going to qualify that in verse 17, it doesn't say you won't have glory unless you suffer, but it's possible. And if it's possible that we suffer, then we go through the suffering with the same mentality that Christ did when he suffered, and that was what? It was all for a end, and the end would be the glory. All right, so now then, that's just a theme of Scripture, that uh, first the suffering, and then the glory that should follow. All right, now then, maybe that's as an introduction. Come back with me to Psalms then again. And this time we're going to move up to chapter 40. Psalms chapter 40. Now, the casual reader will never get the true impact of these psalms. The casual reader will never say, oh, this is Christ speaking. It'll never enter their mind. But it is. The Holy Spirit so inspired David that as he wrote, he was saying it as if Christ himself was saying it. Now keep that in mind as we study. All right, verse 40, uh, chapter 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. 
he inclined unto me and heard my cry. If no other time this should ring a bell, how about that night in the Garden of Gethsemane? Right? How he cried out to the Father, see? Knowing what was coming. Now here's the amazing thing of the crucifixion. Jesus was, in the one hand, totally human. He suffered as any human could have suffered. But on the other hand, he had the deity part of him so that he would know what was coming. See? You know that. Even back there in Luke 18, remember, when he had the 12 as they were getting ready to go up to the Passover. They didn't have a clue of what was coming, but he knew to the last detail, and he told them so. But even though he told them, the Spirit kept it from them so that they did not understand the things that were spoken. But he just tells us now, as believers today, that number one, Jesus knew exactly what was coming. As I've said over and over through the years, he could have named those Roman soldiers who drove the spikes. He could have named every person out there in that Jewish crowd that were hooting and, and ridiculing him. But at the same time, he suffered as a human, and the Holy Spirit kept the understanding from the 12, so they didn't know. But anyways, if you keep that in mind, then these verses in Psalms are truly graphic. I waited patiently for the Lord as he cried out to the Father, and he inclined unto me, and he heard my cry. Verse 2, he brought me up. Now, this is after his death, and he's been in the grave. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a rock. In other words, after his resurrection, he is now in a position to bring in salvation for the human world, but also to set things in motion for his coming kingdom. And he established my goings. Verse 3, he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear. Now, don't let that word throw a curve at you. What is the meaning of fear, especially in the Old Testament? The fear of God is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. See? So the fear that's used here is not a shaking in their boots, but it was an understanding of the mind of God himself. See? All right, so many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord, that is, the God of glory. All right, now verse 4. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, or the place of his faith. I'll repeat the blessing again. Blessed is that man who respecteth not the proud. Now, don't lose your negative there. The true believer has no room in his thinking for pride and evil and lying. My goodness, lying, lying, lying. It's almost gotten to be the sin of the day, isn't it? They lie through their teeth. Doesn't bother them. No, no conviction, no embarrassment. They just go on as though nothing was ever said. In the business world, as well as in everyday life, and uh, you know, I'll never forget, I won't either. I'll pass that one up. Sorry about that. All right. Verse 4 again, so blessed, happy is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and not the things of the ungodly world. So he doesn't have any respect for the proud, the puffed up. He has no respect for such as turn aside to lies. That's just opposite of the mindset of our God. All right, verse 5, many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to usward. They cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. All right, now again, that's from the prophetic speaking of the Lord himself. But I can't help but think of a verse that Paul writes, and I'm going to have to use it. Uh, that's why I think these things pop into my mind. This isn't in my preparation whatsoever, believe me. But come back with me to Ephesians, because I just had a letter in the mail the other day, or a phone call, I don't remember what it was, but they were asking about this very term, Ephesians 
chapter 3, verse 8. And if this isn't almost a perfect parallel with Psalms 40 and verse 5. Ephesians 3, verse 8. <clears throat> and again, remember, who's writing? Well, it's the Apostle Paul writing to Gentiles. He's writing to us. And so he speaks of himself here, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the what? Unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, beloved, do you get an idea what he's talking about? He could never put into any language the riches of Christ. It's beyond human understanding. What little we get, we take by faith, and we glory in that. But, oh, beloved, the understanding that we're going to have someday. But here it is. They're unsearchable. Well, then I had another question that followed it, and I used this for the answer. The, the individual wrote and asked, what does it mean in verse 18? Now I'll just skip across the page, at least in my Bible. Same chapter. This is Bible study, so I don't have to stay on a format. Uh, that's why I don't use outlines. I, I'd go nuts if I had to go by an outline. But here we go across the page to chapter 3, verse 18. And the same apostle is still writing to us, and he says that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Now, what makes that so different? There's four dimensions. We live in three. So what's the fourth dimension? That unsearchable. <laughs> That's the only way I can put it. That unsearchable that we will never be able to comprehend till we get there. And then we're going to have full knowledge. All right, now you might as well keep your hand here in Ephesians because I think when I get back to Psalms, next verse. Uh, yeah, next verse. Come back. Keep your hand in Ephesians. If you want to, while I'm looking, you can go up to Hebrews because that's where I'm going to go next. Hebrews chapter 10. But come back to Psalms first so that you'll see what I'm driving at. Psalms 40 again. <clears throat> verse 6 still speaking as if it were the Lord himself. David is writing it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but it's just as if he's taking the words that the Lord Jesus will speak in his first advent. Psalms 40, verse 6, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. My ears hast thou opened, Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Now, that was two of the four major offerings in, in Judaism. So, burnt offering and sin offerings thou hast not required. Now, I've got to stop a minute. Another verse comes to mind. Boy, I'll keep you busy now, won't I, Marilyn? Isaiah, chapter 1. Because I think this is all so apropos in what we're talking about. Isaiah chapter 1, start verse 10. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Now, I'm using these just to show you what scriptures are talking about. What does Psalms 40 back here mean when it says, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire? Well, I thought that was all part of the law. Didn't you? Isn't that part of Judaism where the sacrifices and so forth? Well, under good normal circumstances, yes. But what had happened in Israel? Unbelief. Did they still practice them? Sure. But did it have any spiritual significance? No. Why? Because they weren't doing it in an attitude of belief and faith. They were just doing it because it was the prescribed religious way to do. Ring a bell? Ring a bell? That's exactly what churches are today. See? All right, but now look what the real attitude was that God hated. Isaiah 1, verse 10, where the prophet writes, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Now, this is from the previous verse, a reference to Jerusalem. So hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Jerusalem. Give ear unto the law 
of our God, ye people of Gomorrah, because up in the previous verse he said they were like Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's Jerusalem. All right, now here it comes, verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? Multitude. Have you any idea how many animals were killed every year up there at the temple in fulfillment of these religious rituals? Thousands of them. I think Josephus made the, the claim of a million, and I find that hard to believe, but whatever. I'm going to be a little more uh, easier to accept. But thousands every year were sacrificed. How much of it amounted to anything? Very little, because it wasn't done in the attitude of faith. It was just simply done as a religious ritual. See? All right, read on in Isaiah. So he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice unto me, saith the Lord? I am full. Now, how would we say it today? You got it, Charlie. I've had it, God says. <laughs> I've had it with all of your sacrifices. The burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or the he goats. You see that? didn't mean anything to God anymore because it wasn't being brought in the prescribed way. All right, verse 12. When you come to appear before me, that is now in the temple, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more, or let's put it as we would say it, don't bring me any more of your vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me, the new moons, which were all part of Judaism, remember? The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. And again, put it in everyday language. What's he say? I've had it. End it. It doesn't do any good. See? Even your solemn meeting, verse 14, your new moons, your appointed feasts, my soul hateth, and don't forget who's speaking, God is, through the prophet. I am weary to bear them. And then verse 15, and when you spread forth your hands, oh my goodness, what did they think they were doing? Oh, they thought they were showing worship. We were in a meeting one time, honey, you remember, don't you? And I said, what a fake. It's all fake. They don't mean anything. And see, Israel was doing the same thing. Oh, you know, they would pretend that they were worshiping and they would raise their hands and all. And God hated it. It's no different today. All right? So he says, when you spread forth, verse 15 again, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I'll not hear. Your hands are full of blood. In other words, guilt, not necessarily of, of murder, but all kinds of moral guilt. You, you see that now? All right. Now from Psalms, then, let's go up to Hebrews chapter 10, which is a good parallel for Psalms number 40. And uh, verse 6 again, while you're looking, I'll reread it. Sacrifice and offering, now it is not desire. In other words, speaking of God, he'd had it with Israel's religion. Mine ears thou hast opened, burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. And then verse 7, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. All right, now Hebrews chapter 10. Let's see how that was fulfilled. And as I feel, the apostle Paul wrote Hebrews. And so after the fact now, Paul can reflect back on everything that the psalmist had put in the mouth of the Lord Jesus and see how it comes out again. Oh my, time is about gone. Verse 1, for the law, the Judaic law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things themselves, they can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect or spiritually mature. It, it couldn't do it. Now verse 2. For then would they have not 
ceased to be offered because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins, but they did. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, the sheep and the goats and what have you, in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. Reading on, verse 4, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Now here comes a quote from Psalms, and so we know that the Holy Spirit inspired David to write what the Lord himself would say later. Verse 5, Wherefore then, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldst not. Now doesn't that give you goosebumps? It should. Here he is saying the same words that David put in Psalms 40. Now what does that tell us? This book is supernatural. And yet mankind hates it. They scorn it. They ridicule it. Just a bunch of fables and legends and myths. No, it isn't. It's the revealed Holy Spirit inspired word of God. And it is so perfectly written out. All right, back to Hebrews 10. Verse 6 again, in the burnt offerings and sacrifices of sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, now remember Paul is quoting from Psalms 40, and that Psalms 40 was the words of the Lord Jesus as he performed the work of the cross. Then I said, lo, I come in the volume of the book that is in the word of God, it's written, to do thy will, O God, all right, then verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Now you see why I read Isaiah 1? Why not? Because it wasn't amounting to anything. It was done without faith. It was just a ritual that they thought they had to do because their neighbor was doing it. This is the way mom and daddy did it. This is the way grandpa did it. But it had no redeeming value whatsoever. See? Oh, my goodness. They're counting down my seconds. All right, one more verse. And so, neither did you have pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Okay, well, let's stop there. We'll pick it up in our next half hour. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.